<laughs> good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to the Making Learning Addictive Show. I am your host, Brian Romero Smith. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I know we're supposed to go on at 7.30. But you know, life just seems to happen. That's not a problem at all. But I'm super, super excited uh, for tonight's conversation on the Making Learning Addictive show. I've got a special co-host with me, Shana Glass. Go ahead and say hello, Shana. Good evening and welcome. So excited <laughs> to be here. Uh, I'm glad you also survived Snowvit 21 as is on my tag. I know. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Only in Texas, right? Only in Texas, only in Texas. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, two very special guests along uh, with us tonight. Um, a living legend, uh, Christine Darden, and her beautiful daughter, who's also my auntie, Jen. <laughs> Jen. I see I wasn't gonna tell anybody, but I decided to, you know, to throw that in there. Janet Darden Gibson, ladies and gentlemen, welcome the both of them, please. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Good to be here. Well, uh, thank you for uh, taking the invitation. Um, I, I know we had to cancel last week because we were having, you know, winter storms here in Texas. But, um, you know, we go with the flow, so to speak. So how are the both of you right now? I'm doing well. Yeah, same. Same, doing well. Doing well. So, you know, for the audience, know you're on two different sides of the, the country. Jenny, you're in mountain time zone. Yes, I am out here in the suburb of Denver in Aurora, Colorado. Um, been here for what, almost seven years this time. So, yeah. And I'm on the coast of Virginia. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic Ocean. Yes, I kind of miss that side of the country. Yes, how's the weather? How's how's oh, we had, life? We been? had a beautiful today. We had a beautiful day today. Um, Make, making me jealous. I know. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, you know, for those who 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 don't know, um, we're, this is Black History Month. Well, they know it's Black History Month, but in celebration of Black History Month and then going into uh, Women in History Month in March. We wanted to bring you both onto the show to talk a little bit about uh, STEM and through the generations, um, because you know many p may be familiar with uh, uh, starting your, your illustrious career, you know, and your groundbreaking uh, uh, work that you've done at, with NASA, uh, but the direct influence on your own daughter in following in those footsteps, but then taking that onto another level is something that we actually want to grab on because we believe that the work that you both are doing will inspire a, a, a new generation to come, so to speak. That's why Shane is not in her head like that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the work that, that you both are doing and how that inspires even me um, <laughs> um, to want to, to want to, wanna, to pass that on to my daughter. So I, I can't wait for us to have a conversation about how how you how you started here, um, how you wanted to continue in this, uh, Janet, and where do you see this going for the for twenty one twenty twenty one and beyond? Right. You want okay, me to so, so let's start here. Let's start here. Okay. A couple of years ago, there was a, a interview that you did, Janet. Uh, in Colorado, I probably don't remember. It's 2017, uh, right after the movie uh, Hidden Figures came out. They came out and interviewed you, and you had all these wonderful pictures, you know, of you and your childhood, uh, and you're talking about the um, the emotions that you're going through, seeing the story finally coming out. You know, so let's let's start there. So tell us a little bit about how I was growing up with your mom actually being an actual hidden figure? Well, you know, I think, ironically, it was common practice, right? We didn't know we were living amongst living legends. <laughs> um, you know, Catherine Johnson and my mother sang in our church choir together. We, The church that was depicted in the movie was Carver Memorial Presbyterian Church. And so, Brian, I would tell you that it wasn't until you know, 
personally, I got into my own engineering curriculum, but I think Hidden Figures taught us all that we were living among greatness. Um, you know, we knew math and science were important, and we knew, and I knew, my, my father was a science teacher in high school, and my mother worked at NASA, so there was an expectation, but I'll tell you, it, um, it wasn't until the book was written and the movie came out that I really understood that it wasn't commonplace and that we needed to tell that story. The whole town felt that way. <laughs> uh, everybody says, we didn't know what you all were doing. <laughs> So, so what was that like? I mean, I mean, while you're you're doing this work, um, did you realize that you are really, you know, breaking ground, you know, and and creating history, you know, in the moment? Well, we were working on some pretty fantastic projects and things out there. Uh, so I I knew that I knew what we were doing. Uh, I I went to NASA just as the Apollo program was starting. And so I worked in that a, a bit. And after a few years, I was a human computer. That's it. So, uh, so I worked there for about five years. And then I found out that some of the engineers there had math degrees rather than engineering degrees. And I says, well, gosh, I want to be over there. So I started mm -hmm. asking about becoming an engineer. And I was transferred. And I started um, working on supersonic airplanes and uh, divi designing supersonic wings and flaps and things like that. And I did that for about 20, 25 years. Mm. And uh, the airplane, the, the work that I was doing then, uh, Lockheed Martin is actually building a, a low boom uh, X plane right now. And they're supposed to finish it this year and uh, carry it to some flight a uh, test all over the United States, both for the supersonic airplane behavior and for how long loud the sonic boom is. And once they collect data feedback from people who hear it, it's, they say it's almost like a thump that uh, they will, um, NASA will take it to the FAA and ask them to think about a rule change because there is a law on the books right now that says there can be no commercial supersonic flight across the continent in the United States. And that law was put there in 1971 because Boeing was supposed to build the supersonic airplane for this country. And they said, well, I want we want to do a flight test across Oklahoma City first. And so they borrowed military airplanes and they were causing about eight booms over the people every day. And of course, the people started calling about their cracked sheet rocks, their cracked windows, their cracked glass, <laughs> and everything. And and I think the bill they had a pretty hefty bill for fixing up the people's houses for doing that. And so they, uh, Boeing says, we're not going to build a <laughs> supersonic airplane now. Well, because nobody knew anything about how to predict the boom or how it was formed or anything like that. And so uh, once Boeing said, we're not going to build it this year because the English and the French were building theirs and the Russians were building theirs. And so um, the um, when when Boeing quit, then the law got put on the books that there could be no commercial oh, supersonic flight. So the Concorde originally when it started flying would fly into Washington and then uh, fly on down to Houston. Mm. or something. But once they put the law on the books, when they flew down to Houston, they had to go subsonically because uh, they couldn't go supersonically. And of course, that used even more gas and everything. So uh, they didn't do that as much after that law was put on the books. Wow. Oh, I, just, I just learned so much. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm excited to see what comes out. Um, what's the next steps? You know, if if they change the law. Well, yeah, well, that will depend on whether the people believe that, that, that this would not bother them if they had airplanes. You know, if, if American and Delta and all of them buy these airplanes and fly across country, you could now, you could probably now get from New York to Los Angeles in a couple of hours rather than wow. four, five, four hours or so. 
<laughs> that's that's the benefit. That it depends on the speed of that airplane. So, so this is the work that you were doing, you know? Right. Uh, yes. That that is the work. That was what I was working on, and I worked on it, and I really enjoyed it. We did a we did some flight test out in California to, because we we started in wind tunnels. I first designed. I first wrote a computer program because we didn't have big computers then, and we didn't have a lot of people doing computational fluid dynamics. So we were using kind of a linearized theory that uh, people had thought about ever since the first airplane went supersonic, which was 1947. And so uh, we were, and so we uh, actually, several, before I got to NASA, a number of researchers kind of all over the country had put brought together some of the ideas people had about how maybe we would handle this problem. And so we, I wrote the computer program and designed an airplane. And then one coworker and I went into the wind tunnel and tested our models. And we put a test model of a regular military airplane in there. And the military airplane was still giving a big boom in the wind tunnel. You know what a wind tunnel is? Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it was giving a big boom. And the two models that we designed that were supposed to be softer were softer. And we so we said this looks like it's going in the right direction. And about that time, uh, because Apollo was costing so much, the SST funds stopped a bit. Mm. And in about two years, Congress decided to fund the environmental part of the SST concerns. And so they gave us money again. And I was asked to get everybody in the country that had worked on Sonic Boom and bring them to Langley and have a meeting with them for a couple of days so that we could decide had there been any progress made in any one area, for instance, composite materials, such could we now build a supersonic airplane out of composites? That would be a, a really great breakthrough because the airplane would be a much lighter airplane. Uh, but that had not been done. And so we kept this. We said, OK, how the airplane is designed and how it is flown would be certainly what we have to continue to research. That's what we had done. How it comes through 45 or 50,000 feet in the atmosphere. Uh, and, and gets on the ground without destroying everything we were trying to do. And we actually went to uh, to New Mexico and actually did some flight tests at White Sands Missile Range down there and measured the signals in a calm atmosphere and in a very turbulent atmosphere to see what it does do to that signal coming all the way through the atmosphere. And uh, and then finally, the acousticians are the ones who who decide. Okay, how do we measure this sonic boom? Are we measuring? Are we using the right factor to measure this to tell people what they're hearing or to know what to soften? Mm -hmm. We had an acoustics branch at Langley, and and those people were working on that there. And uh, so um, so that's what we decided we would do. And I had. Like I had about 150 people there, uh, people who had done a lot of the thinking for the last 15 or 20 years on that. And uh, so th that was what we decided we were going to do. And I became the lead person in the design and operation of the airplane. And so uh, and, and we started working with other NASA centers. They started coming to Langley and designing and testing. Boeing started coming, McDonnell Douglas started coming, and professors who, uh, Texas A&M professors, I got to know several of them, uh, Penn State professors, Princeton uh, people who had worked on it. We had everybody that had done some work and they kind of joined a steering team that we formed to make sure that we were following our ideas about how to do this. And uh, so we, Everybody tested their designs and everything. We kept going. And after we had, were getting, you know, really good answers in the wind tunnel, we said we needed to do a flight test. And we started working with DARPA. And uh, DARPA borrowed two F-5 supersonic jets from the Air Force. We left one F-5 the same as it was. 
we took the other F5 and put some panels on it. What we were having, having to do was design this airplane so that the area, equivalent area of that airplane matched what came out of the computer program. Great. Wow. And, and that's what we did. And, and I was on, the, I was on the, I was not in California the day they did the test, but I was, I was on, um, the telephone with a friend who was in the control room. And so I, um, when they started bringing the links into the control room, everybody in there started shouting because they got a big loud boom from the F5 that had not been changed. And they got a much softer boom from the F5 that was designed a different way. And uh, it was then that that we kind of said, you know, this looks like there's some possibilities here. And and NASA started working with the designers saying, maybe you all should start designing some of these airplanes because uh, the one that we just put the extra panels on, it looks kind of dumpy. It didn't look like a supersonic airplane, but oh, yeah. they started designing differently. And then in 2018, NASA put out a contract to have this low boom X plane built, and Lockheed Martin is building it out in Palmdale, California. Crazy. Okay, mm -hmm. I have a question. I had a I have a few questions. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but but my question is 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 for well it's it's, it's a double question. So, Miss um, Darden, I'm going to ask you. You mentioned earlier, you know, the community didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> Like they, they didn't know what we were doing. You said it just like that. Like they didn't, they didn't know what we were doing. But Janet, mm -hmm. when your mom came home at night after doing all of this. <laughs> <laughs> like, what was the conversations? And what is like? I'm sitting here. My child doesn't. Even, I'm trying to get her to pay attention to what she's trying to figure out what I'm doing. Well, I think Janet knew a little bit, didn't you? <laughs> You asking me now? <laughs> well, I mean, I think. Well, I, and I certainly went on travel. I went out. I went. I, I, I so traveled a lot. She traveled a lot. She was also working on. I was 13 years old when she graduated from George Washington University with her doctorate in mechanical engineering. Yeah. So, so I knew, you know. But I also, um, I must say, and and. My husband, Brian's uncle, says this to me all the time that we were fortunate enough, both of her parents, her parents met, my grandparents met at Knoxville College, graduates, college graduates, both my parents were college graduates. And so there was an element of expectation. Now, you asked me, did I know she was a big deal? I think I did. I, 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 I've toured those, um, I toured those wind tunnels. We had summer events at NASA, but again, it was a community church, you know, back then it was church, it was school, you know, you go back to church, but the people, the women, the professionals we were surrounded by were all, I think, uh, representative of what she has accomplished too. And so, um, yeah, I knew she was a big deal, but probably not as big as we should have um, lauded her for being. How about that? Did it set an expectation, you know, knowing that everyone in the community, you know, were mathematicians? Really? And, oh, I mean, absolutely. You know, just the level of knowledge. You said 13, you, you received, um, um, Dr. Darton, you received yeah. your, your, math, your doctorate, you know, in mechanical engineering. I mean, just knowing, you know, yeah. Well, you know, one of uh, as Janet and I were talking a little bit, one of the things that I thought was important for Janet and was that she have a good foundation in math and science and everything. So it was picking the school that she went to. That's my yeah. daughter's entering. She <laughs> tried to hide. <laughs> Yes, and, and um, because act, I started when I when I when I 
retired from NASA, one of my friends across the street asked me to tutor her daughter in plain geometry. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and I talked about the the uh, fundamentals of plain geometry with her and everything was fine. She seemed to understand everything and everything went well. And I said, well, why does she need tutoring? So I gave her some problems to work. And I found out that what she didn't know was fractions, something she should have learned in the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, and so, you know, you've got to be concerned because math, you've got to know the addition and the fixings and the fractions. You've got to learn everything when you're supposed to learn it, because everything else after that is going to use it. And and I also think you've got to recognize that anybody can do it. There's a there's a in my opinion, when I grew up, you you could easily and I've got a 15 year old. You can easily get sidetracked and said, I don't know math. I don't like math. I don't do math. And what does that do to your psyche? Right. right. I never experienced that. It was bring it. Right. I, I never it was never told to me that you can't do something ever. Wow. Shana, you're on mute. Um, Dr. Darwin, what obstacles did you face? Uh, in terms of the subject itself or in terms yeah. of what the maths are in working? Yeah, what, what, what interested you in mathematics to get to this point? Because well, I think that was your leading. Oh, well, I'm not going to assume. I'm going to ask. Okay, I, I, I went to, I had a segregated background in schools. And so they didn't teach very many advanced math and physics classes in the schools that I went to. I took algebra in um, my school in Monroe. And then I went to um, and I found out how much I really enjoyed physical science because I had talked thought about being a doctor. But when I took biological science and physical science, I found out I love physical science so much more. Mm -hmm. OK, so I went to a boarding school in the 11th grade. And uh, the only class that I could take was plain geometry when I got there, that the only other math class. And I fell in love with it. I loved the way the lady taught the class. I really enjoyed that class. I decided in that class I wanted to be a mathematician. And uh, so it, you know, and I actually started thinking about how do I get to, I, I don't have all this math background. So I actually spent a number of years building my math background in this. And uh, so I got, I actually, ended up getting a master's degree in applied mathematics at another school after I finished college and had a teacher certificate. So I taught math for a number of years. And one of the things I think when, when students ask me, why do I need to learn that and things, I think mm -hmm. the teacher always needs to answer that. Why do you need to learn this? Because this is what that does. That one of the things that really interested me when I took plain geometry was that I could take one of the equations that we got in, in plain geometry and I could tell you how tall a pole was across this little river in, next to me because I could measure how far it was to the base of that pole. <laughs> and then all I had to do was look up and see what that angle was, how, what that angle was that I was looking upward to get to the top of the pole. And I could tell how, ta how tall the pole was. And I was never over there on the pole. So and, and so I said, you know, what really interests me is how mathematics works in the real world, because it does so many fabulous things for us. And that's what I think I wanted to learn. That's why I got my master's in applied mathematics. But my senior year in high school, my job was in the boarding school. My job was to bring the morning newspaper into the school and put it in the library. Do you know what the headline was my senior year? Soviets launch satellite into space. Yeah. It is traveling over us at 18,000 miles an hour. It has crossed over us four times in the last 24 hours. Wow. So that was my senior year. We made our yearbook a space theme. We, uh, I mean, you know, that was just great. After that, I left and went, came to Virginia to go to Hampton Institute. Well, all of the all of the students um, coming to Hampton Institute to major in math were coming from DC and New York and the bigger cities over here. And they had had calculus and trigonometry and analytical geometry and all those things. 
And I says, gosh, I'd have to start at the bottom and, you know, move up. But, but my dad called me and said, well, I think you ought to get a teacher certificate. And so that's what I, I had been thinking about. And I said, OK, I will get the teacher certificate. But if I want to be a mathematician, I got to have a lot of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, I'm saying I got to take four years to get this teacher certificate. But in those four years, I am going to be earning elective credits. In other words, I will, I can take, so, I'm taking so many classes, I, I get all these free elective classes that I'll have and I can take them for free without paying extra money. So my senior year, I did my student teaching in math. I took four higher level math classes, you know, the, the, the high, high classes. <laughs> Second semester, I did my student teaching in physics and four higher level math classes. And, and because I had thought my way through this, it gave me the courage to take these four math, eight math classes my senior year and not have to pay for them. But it, it, it gave me the background I began to need in mathematics. I went off to teach. And as soon as I got there, uh, Teachers came and said, we get we take courses at Virginia State because they teach them to us for free because we teach in Virginia. Oh. Would you like to go? I said, yes. So I went and made sub, registered for another high level math class, took it that year and everything went great. Two or three years later, I actually uh, was telling the people where I was teaching down here, we need to go to Virginia State and you can take classes free for what you're teaching to help get, you know, what you're doing. Well, I did, I uh, did that at Virginia State and um, it, it went well. But what happened was within, within a few months, I found out that my husband was, go was getting a fellowship to get a master's there. And so I said, well, it looks like I need, might be needing to move here. So the next time I went to class um, in Petersburg, I went up to my teacher and says, well, it looks like I might be moving here. Uh, do you know of wh where I might find a job here and everything? He says, oh, you might be moving here. I said, yeah. He said, let me take you across the hall to the head of the physics department. He's looking for a research assistant in aerosol physics. He's looking for somebody to do the light scattering of non-spherical particles in the atmosphere. So that was going I would get paid for that, but I also would earn enough money to get a master's degree from Virginia State without having to pay. So that's how I got the master's degree because I because I took the math in the first place. It's like the first things I did by taking that extra math led me straight Okay, so when, when I was getting ready to graduate uh, from Virginia State with my master's, I went to the placement office and the young lady said, where have you been? I said, what do you mean where I've been? I've been here. She said, but didn't you know NASA was here recruiting yesterday? I said, no, I didn't know that. She said, they were. Here, you fill out this application and get it back to me and I'm gonna mail it in. She did that. Three weeks later, I had an offer from NASA. <laughs> college all, opportunities college opportunities first of all i'm sitting here looking at my junior you know in high school like dude you ain't got no excuse get at it <laughs> but but what i did what i started doing uh in in at hampton in, in undergraduate school is what led me there Gotcha. And then uh, and then when they they switched me to engineering, when I said I wanted to go there, that's when I went and signed up for that doctorate program at George Washington, because I said, I don't want anybody saying anything to me about it. I don't have an engineering degree. There you go. Mm -hmm. I, I read once that you you question how only the, the white men were being promoted. Well, that OK, that's I did. I was talking about that. I, I said one day and I was talking to a friend of mine and I said, I wonder why all the women are going in the computer polls. The women were there to help reduce the data and write reports and scatter the aviation information through all the aviation industry in this country. And so I, and then I said, well, and so all the women are going in the computer polls. They don't. They don't do any research. They do what the engineers tell them to do. They um, 
they don't give talks, they don't write papers, and they don't publish papers, and they aren't getting promoted. And the men, of course, are doing research, they are giving talks, they are writing papers, they are publishing papers, and they are getting promoted. But then, And that's when I said, well, then all the men are getting put in the engineering offices, but I guess they all got engineering degrees. And this young lady said, no, there are several of these men have math degrees. I said, oh, is that right. And that's when I started asking. And that's when I made the decision to go to a director higher level and say, why are a male and a female coming here? This was more a male female thing coming here, come with the same, pretty much the same background, but the women are in the computer pool and they aren't getting promoted because of everything. The, the men are getting promoted. Uh, and I, and uh, I'd like to know why this happens. The, the, the boss looked at me and he says, nobody has ever asked me that question before. Wow. I said, well, I'm asking it now. And two weeks later, I went back to my office. Two weeks later, I got promoted because I hadn't been promoted since I'd been there. And I got transferred to engineering wow. for opening my mouth. Speak up. So let your voice right. be heard. And now my mother would get my mother got on me about speaking up. She actually told me she gave me a conversation course. She said, you got to learn how to talk to people. <laughs> yes, and I will, yeah, and I will tell you the education, e even without them talking about education all the time in my house, it was known that everybody was going somewhere and go to school. It was just the, the attitude there. And I sat at the dining room table with them in the evenings when everybody else was gone and they'd have me working problems or doing homework and things like that. But I helped my dad change the tires on his car. I helped my dad you know, I actually worked on the carburetor one time. I, my brother messed up my bicycle brakes and everything. I got a coat hanger and fixed my my bicycle brake. That's what's up. Right. So, so I was I was actually doing a number of things, and I was competing with boys in school, which uh, I think also helped me work with men at work. Well, I will tell you this: I'm I'm definitely going to add you to the list of the most brilliant people I've ever spoken with. Uh, but Janet is one of those people that I've already had on that list. Uh, and it's funny because when she and my wife get together, their engineer brains, you know, kind of take over. Uh, <laughs> however, Jan Janet, in that speaking up, you know, aspect, I'm going to uh, assume that that was also uh, passed on to you that you needed to speak up. And you've been able to take your ability to, to outthink most to ad advance, take, well, leverage that STEM, you know. Um. I think probably some of the activities and things that I took Janet to probably introduced her maybe to what she didn't even know she was getting introduced to. <laughs> <laughs> so I, listen, um, I, I can remember, you talk about speaking up, Brian. Um, we were talking earlier today, mom and I, about, you know, she reared me and she reared my, my nieces and nephews and would go into the educational system, the classroom, to talk to the teachers and advocate for us. So I was able to see that pretty early on. Um, maybe it wasn't always related to math and science, but if something wasn't right, she wasn't rude, she wasn't loud. But you understood what she said. And it was a it was a model for me that said, you know, you do have a voice and you need to use it to speak up for yourself. So, um, yeah, it's come in handy in my career and in and, and college. And um, I try to teach my kids the same thing. But I, I, no one's going to advocate for you like you. Well, she, she, she we, uh, my, her, her niece told me the other day, she, she, she was, uh, she was in a, the same school Janet went to. And they had this pre-algebra class that they broke up and sent some of the students on to algebra and kept some in pre-algebra. Pre and they kept my granddaughter in pre-algebra. And she came home. She would come to my house and study at night. She said, they did not let me move up into algebra. Grandma, I, that is not right. All my friends are up there in that algebra class. I think you need to go down to that school and talk to those teachers. So I went to that school for all of her 
what seventh grade teachers or whatever the grade was. And I told them she is very upset that she did not get sent to the algebra class. And, um, you know, they sat there and talking and then they said, well, you know, it's too late for her now. You know, this is, they've already been in class now for a while. I said, well, what if I take if what if I teach her and catch her up? Mm-hmm. And uh, they looked at me and, and they said, well, if you can do that. And in fact, the lady that was going to give me a book, she says, I don't have the key to the, the teacher's edition. I said, that's all right. Just give me the book. And, uh, and and Kristen told us the other night that she actually fell in love going through that process. She moved, she caught up with them. She w- moved on with them in algebra. And she said at Howard University, she, they, she was taking calculus in a class by herself and they were going to, they were going to kill, you know, it, it, it killed the class because she was the only student and she begged them not to, and they mm. kept it there for her. And she oh. said, she loves me. Now she just finished med school. And so she's doing her, she's doing her residency right now, but she says she loves that math. And they both came to, they both came to NASA for some kind of summer program once or twice. Yeah. I'm like, I'm just in, in love with this conversation. So I, I do have another question. <laughs> um, so the, the, both of you are have set that bar. Um, not just Dr. Darden, you didn't just set that bar for Janet. Um, Janet, you're not just setting that bar for your for your kids. Um, students who are listening to this. So that last statement about your granddaughter being the only one in the class. I know of a teacher who teaches computer science um, here in the Houston area, and she teaches at a young women's academy. And she teaches a few courses where there are only one. Um, literally there's only one in that class to the point to where she's combining classes, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. to, to reach those girls. Our teachers are, it's been a rough year. What would you say? Because what we do have a lot of kids that don't have this foundation that you both have set, right? They don't have, you know, mathematicians that they know of in their community. They're, they're there but they don't necessarily know of them there. What would you say one to the teacher as to, to keep them like, continue that opportunity? Like it, it, that was a huge, that was a blessing that they kept that course open for your granddaughter. Well, that that's, normally that's, happen. That's, that's, <laughs> you know, that doesn't normally happen. Um, but our teachers, they need to know, that especially women um, educators in computer science and programming, in STEM fields, it's, we're trying to recruit more girls. This is. I'm trying to keep them there. Now that, that is, I found out since I've yes, been speaking that the girl, a lot of the girls in engineering school still do drop out, but they, they said it's, it's either the male classmates or the male professors that are causing part of this problem. Now Janet's son told me, he says, Grandma, you know why I love to read so much and so on, so on, so on, so on. Because there was some a little section of books. What 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 was it? What were those books, Janet? What are the books? The the, the re- magic tree magic treehouse. Magic oh, tree house. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, Coleman and I must have read every book they ever wrote. And we we he would read that, we would discuss it, we would learn the history that went with that book because a lot of things went with with those books and everything. So I spent quite a bit of time in Georgia with Coleman while everybody else was at work and <laughs> or everything. And uh, he, he told me, he says, I think that's why I enjoy reading so much because we went through those books and read them and discussed them and had a great time. Mm, so, so I'm gonna take that as telling teachers just be there for those students. Well, they do. You know what I tell students? Well, and, and I don't know. Yes, if what would you tell kids? Person, <laughs> but if, you, if, if, they, if they know what they like, I think if you understand, if you actually say, well, do I like biology? You know, is that my passion and so forth? Well, I discovered that math was my passion. And, you know, with the physical science in there, too. And, uh, and I said, now, how do I get to be a mathematician? I perceive of myself as a mathematician first. Uh, 
This is, and I actually taught my, that geometry class that year when we switched with the teacher. Then I said, now, what is it I need? What am I missing that I need if I'm going to be a mathematician? Well, I told you I had algebra and plain geometry. That's all. So what do I need? I need a whole lot of mathematics. I knew that. And then the third, so that's perceive of myself, plan how you get there. And the third thing is start preparing. Start working that plan of what you said. Well, I actually did when I took all those four, eight classes my senior year in college. And those were all electives that I didn't have to take. And uh, so I did that. And then the fourth P is persist. Do not quit. Mm. Do not quit. Figure out what it is you need to do not to quit. And, you know, I took two classes at the same time one semester. Uh, to, had to kind of pretty much study on my own for one of the classes. Persist. And one of the things that I added to is I, I spoke to the Girl Scouts in San Francisco and they said, we want our girls to have these characteristics when they leave here. I want them to be go getters. Don't always sit back and wait for other people to start everything. Sometimes you need to initiate some things. You need to initiate going to talk to so and so and so and so. OK, so be a go getter. That's G. I be an innovator. If you run into a detour, or you run into some kind of problem, then you solve that problem mm. and, then, um, and, and keep going. OK, and then the aura, be a risk taker. That means you have to get out of your comfort zone sometimes. Well, when I, when I asked that b boss about transferring, I had asked the immediate boss about transferring to engineering, and he said no. And so that's when I sat down and thought for a week or two, said, I'm going to a higher up d director. And I asked him and I, I realized that, that at that time I could have been fired because he was the other guy's boss because I was going up the chain. So and I had thought about that. I said, well, if I get fired, I'll go get a job teaching at a college. Uh, but I kept going. And that when he, that changed my whole career at NASA, when he told me. You, he switched me. He switched me. And I actually I actually saw a birthday card I got from him two or three years ago, Janet. And he said, yes, Christine Darden, I remember you. Do I remember you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? And I agree with everything you're saying, but I think there's also got to be a path for those who don't know what they want to do. And, well, I, well, and I would tell you, well, let me finish. Let me finish. Yes. I would tell I would tell you that my math and science background, I went and got my math degree and my engineering degree and I lead a talent acquisition organization. I've done sales, I've done marketing, but I tell you what, there's not a whole lot that I can't go do because it opened the doors for me. So even if you don't know at a young age what you want to do, do well in the math, the sciences, so that people can't tell you what you can't do. And it buys you time and it gives you options to find out what it is you want to do. I think that is my story more than, you know, I, to her chagrin, I did not stay in STEM, but it's, it, it has been just as impactful in my professional career as if I had stayed in math. And science. I don't know that I have ever regretted that. But there are people who get their daughters to take that just to train the way they think. Well, and, and I think we're saying somewhat the same yes, thing, because yeah. if you can academically prove that you can handle the rigors of those curricula, then you can right. pretty much do whatever you, no one can tell you she can't do this. Right. Right. Now, absolutely. Don't, absolutely. absolutely. That, yeah, that's, well, <laughs> that's right, too. And and one of the uh, one of I guess one of the things I said about passion is if you really like a subject, you're going to work. You're going to work really hard to, to, to get it done, to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to sit out there at that desk all day long doing those problems. Or you got this 15 pages and the answer came out wrong the second time. You're going to work it the third time and do 15 more pages to see which answer was right. <laughs> so, so, I, need, I need for our young people to hear that because this generation, I'm not going to play say all of them. 
but a lot of them, a lot of these things that you're saying, it's a struggle for young people today. Mm-hmm. That that persistence is it's difficult for some kids, and they need a they need a lot of motivation to tr- to see that they must persist. I, you know, yeah. you being there to make sure that they got it, making sure I know that know that I have your back. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure telling your mm-hmm. your granddaughter's mm-hmm. to school, you know, she needs to be in there and I'm going to make sure she's successful. A lot of kids need that. They need to know that there's somebody there that will push them when they don't know exactly yet, as you said, yeah. Yeah. exactly what it is that they they necessarily want to do, especially mm-hmm. girls, especially mm-hmm. girls. Yeah. And, you know, in uh I, I've been to the library lots of times. I will find several books that are in the same subject area because I tell students, you know, all teachers and all authors don't write everything the same way. And some of these textbooks you might understand and actually follow better than you do others. And so I have actually learned, gotten an idea about how to solve a problem from a different textbook that I've pulled down and looked at and read and everything. And it has helped me tremendously. Now I can go back to the regular textbook and know and understand what it is that I didn't understand before. Um, she, she is a researcher by, um, by nature. I used to come home over the summer from school and be out, you know, I'd come home, she'd be sitting on the couch reading encyclopedia for fun. What's that, what's that encyclopedia? For those folks that... Okay, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Well, we do have children that are watching this right. too. Yeah. <laughs> like to um, they, what an encyclopedia is, and they, it's not that their kids don't don't like to learn, it's, it's different, different, you know, like, they're inquisitive, Yeah. but that persistence is a struggle. Well, yeah, the persist and persistence is important. It really is that you persist in what you're doing. That's that that I've heard that for a number of years that it is uh, very important that you that you are able to keep going that way. I I I, uh, I got angry at one of my co-workers, co-workers at NASA one time because I did. I was supposed to write a computer program computer program from a big equation where well, he got the equation and he did some work with the equation and then he gave it to me mm. and uh, I wrote the program and then he came in and said the answers weren't coming out right. And I said, oh, OK, well, I'll check again. And I went through everything I had done and I, I said I still didn't find anything wrong. And uh, if I run it, I got the same thing. Well, he says it's still wrong. I said, well, you know what? You started this by getting the equation that I needed and by doing several steps. I said, why don't you bring me the paperwork that you went through and when you were changing that equation and let me see if I find anything wrong. And I found a sign wrong. And when I tracked that sign all the way back, where he should have taken it and then put it into the computer program. He came in and he said, the numbers look great. This is things were going as fast. It was, it was trying to get the speed that a spaceship flies in space. Mm -hmm. And it was going like Mach 22, which is 22 times the speed of sound. And, uh, and so he, so yes, uh, he had assumed that I was the one that made the mistake, I guess, which I didn't like that assumption. I said, both of us, you know, could have made the mistake. And, and I went back and looked. I really went back through it to, to see if I'd made a mistake. So, you know, that, that right there you know, reminds me of the fact that we're still in that type of struggle, you know, when, when it comes. Yes, to- we are. We um, are. And, and and that was a while ago, and here we are today, you know, in 2021, where I'm trying to be careful with w- what I'm saying, that women, especially women of color, still have to fight for that type of, you know, respect, you know, that you have the skill set, you have the knowledge, uh, you have the ability to, to, you know, think and analyze and, and all of that, but yet it's it's... One, take it for granted, uh, but two, it is not highlighted initially. It has to be after, oh, I made a mistake, after several, several tries before you begin to acknowledge 
the worth. You know, as we begin to wrap this up, what are some words of encouragement for these young ladies, these young la women of color who are coming up in these fields, who are, you know, either sticking with the STEM or using STEM to, you know, uh, catapult them into, into other fields and other areas, knowing where we still are, you know, in 2021, what are some words of encouragement that you can provide for them um, to help yeah. them continue? Well, I think what I think what Janet said was was important. And I told you I had a friend, Charlie Hill, Janet. He asked his girls to, to major in engineering because he wanted them to learn how to think that way. And and uh, none of them are working as engineers. One of them is a principal of a school, you know, and uh, and so so it is important to learn those things that will make you think. But um, the, the students need to, they need to, to try to learn at each level of studies that they're doing. I also found out that a lot of my math students didn't read math books. I said, why are you not reading math books? Because, because I said, now, you take notes in class. Well, half the time you miss some of the notes that you, you know, that your teacher you don't you don't get it all written down. Work well. Most of this is in your textbook. Read that textbooks. Read those examples that that author wrote for you, and then try to see after you've gone through that example a number of times. See if you can work it. Just write down the problem and close the book and see if you can work it. See if you can follow those steps and, and understand that example. And then I, I think the math book still, the odd answers are in the back of the book. If you work some of those odd problems, you start beginning to understand those problems and everything. And that helps. The more problems you work, the more it helps. But students don't want to do homework. But in math, working those problems is pretty important. It, uh, Janet wants to talk. Yeah, she's on mute. <laughs> to, to answer your question, and I know we're running out of time, I think you, we as women of color have to know going in, we've got to work harder, be smarter, and, you know, don't ever let anyone take you out of your, um, your element in terms of fighting for yourself. Always have grace, always be, you know, respectful, but know that you have a voice and can, um, you know, say it, say it and say it again. Mm -hmm. For people in the back who didn't hear you, but know that you have a right to be there and don't let that room make you think otherwise, right? So, so did you run into that in your engineering classes? Yes, all the time. So. <laughs> Well, and I don't, I, I don't want you to get cut off, Brian, but I think I was dual degree at Spelman and Georgia Tech, but I'll tell you what, the group of us that moved from Spelman in those math classes that went to Georgia Tech, we had confidence. We knew what we could do. We sat in the front of the room and we looked at all those other folks like, yes, we're supposed to be here. And we would pull out our pencils and do. So I, I just think you've got to know your work. Got to know your worth. The confidence is very important because I noticed that in students that would come, you know, people would come and stay with me for a month or two or some summer sometimes. And and I noticed that the level of confidence in the students was very different and it was very important. You've got the self-confidence is important. Absolutely love it. Shana, got last things to say real quick? I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I completely agree, um, especially what you said at the end, Janet, that, that well, both of you, the confidence. Um, young ladies need to know, even even those who are, even the younger ladies, let me say that, I'm not going to say older, <laughs> but as adults, we do too, too need to know that confidence, that it exudes your who you who you are and what you're going to become and that also helps for the younger generation to see that they too must stand yeah. Yeah. and walk in that and walk in your truth and use your voice all of that tonight is exactly what um, our students need to hear our teachers need to 
encourage so that girls feel empowered. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and as much as they can, you know, maybe explain how some of these things work in the real world or what they're for in the real world or give them something in the real world they have to do. One of my math classes, I made them write budgets and keep budgets and stuff like that. They didn't even know how to do it, you know, but it's something in real life that they you use math for. Mm-hmm. I literally told my my 11 year old last night in order to understand math, you must understand money. And if you don't understand money, it doesn't make sense. So that's the way you're going to figure it all out. <laughs> it will help you tremendously. Mm-hmm. So you're absolutely right. I love it all. Well, I want to thank you uh, all for joining us tonight, Ms. Darden, uh, Ms. Gibson, Ms. Glass. It was such a pleasure. Uh, those are very powerful words. Uh, you know, stand in your confidence, know your worth, uh, and then make it applicable to real life. Um, we can do this. And I hope that tomorrow is a much better day than today. Thank you guys for joining us this evening. We'll see you next week on Making Learning Addictive. Good night. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.